Hello, and welcome to Sound and Image Lab, the Dolby Institute podcast. This is a show about how artists use technology to tell their stories, and I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. Well, if you are a regular listener to this podcast, you know that last week I got the chance to sit down with legendary sound designer Gary Rydstrom to talk about the amazing, iconic sound design work for the original Jurassic Park way back in 1993. Well, that was just a teaser, a lead up, if you will, to the conversation that we're having today, which is a deep dive about the new film, Jurassic World Dominion. I'm thrilled to be in conversation today with the director and co-writer of the film, Colin Trevorrow, as well as key members of the film's sound team. We're gonna talk about the film in uh, a fair level of detail, uh, and we're gonna unpack some of the key sequences. So if you haven't had a chance to see it yet, it just opened in a theater near you, I suggest that you hit pause on this conversation, go watch the movie, and then come back and listen to these artists talk about how they did the work. And of course, it is a spectacular presentation in Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos. So if you have one near you, I highly suggest that you buy a ticket and go see this movie at a Dolby Cinema. So I'm thrilled to be in conversation today, as I said, with the director and co-writer Colin Trevorrow, as well as Al Nelson and Gwendolyn Yates Whittle, who are the co-supervising sound editors for the film. It's always a pleasure to have them back on the show, uh, especially Gwen. If you've been listening to the show for a while, you might remember I had a long conversation. Gwen was one of the first guests that we had on the show, episode five, way back in season one. I had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with her about the art and the science of dialogue editing. And uh, if you're new to film sound or maybe don't know what a dialogue editor does or an ADR editor, I suggest that you go take a listen to that conversation. Uh, because Gwen is one of the best in the business at doing what she does. We're joined in conversation also by re-recording mixer Pete Horner, as well as sound designer and re-recording mixer Chris Boys. It was great fun to have Chris on the show. Chris really is a just a, a legendary sound designer on his own. He's won four Academy Awards for his work in sound. And uh, the original Jurassic Park was one of his early films that he worked on at the beginning of his career. So it's great to get his perspective on the whole franchise, which he's been a part of since the very beginning. Uh, I'll, I'll give a, a technical note. I Usually I love to have these conversations in person, these roundtable conversations with the director. We've been able to do that several times over the past year on Dune and the Batman and everything everywhere all at once, which was really fun to have everybody in the room. Unfortunately, this particular team was spread out all over the place, so we weren't able to get everybody in the same room. Uh, Chris Boys, I got to say, he's such a trooper. Uh, he dialed in from New Zealand, uh, as, and it was 6 o'clock on a Sunday morning when he dialed into this conversation. Uh, so he was really uh, so uh, gracious to do that. <laughs> I will say we had a beautiful shot on him, and then as we started... As we got going, the sun rose behind him and he got completely blown out. And so he's totally in silhouette for most of this conversation, which is if you're watching this on YouTube, it's why it, it looks the way it does, but you can hear him just fine. So uh, let's just dive right in. I started the conversation by asking Colin Trevorrow, the director and co-writer of the film. You know, this is the final, the third of the film in the Jurassic World franchise. And I, I asked him what it was like to put in some Easter eggs and, and show some love to the fans by giving callbacks to the first film. Well, I am a fan, so I guess it's giving myself some love. <laughs> but uh, I found it, look, I, I actually really pushed hard against it uh, all the whole time. I, I did not want to do anything that was homage or, or, or nostalgia, or as I heard someone put it yesterday, uh, memory farming, which I thought was a really interesting term. Uh, but in this case, I knew it was going to come out naturally because it's it's in my DNA. It's just something I'm going to do no matter what. So my, my actively pushing against resulted in everything that you see, uh, including probably some that that uh, people will notice on, you know, third, fourth watch if, if they choose. So I know, you know, this team has been together through this entire sort of this three films in the Jurassic World franchise, uh, working with you, Colin, on, on the soundtrack. So I'm, I'm curious, like how the team, in terms of how you guys work together, the approach to these films, how has it evolved over the course of the three movies? The first time we worked together, uh, I think it was, I, it was safety not guaranteed, this group, um, and I know Gwen came in a little bit later, uh, and yet 
we've been doing this since, you know, a, a very small $750,000 movie that still had a moment that had to feel big and epic uh, and, and sci-fi in it. Uh, and so to, to evolve uh, our language together, I mean, these, they all do a lot of huge movies, um, including a very loud one I saw last week with Jet Fighters that was incredible. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, we've over time, uh, formed a dialogue with each other and we understand uh, each other. I think they uh, could probably now just tell you what I'm going to say uh, before I even walk in the room and say it. And, and having uh, that kind of rapport, that kind of, uh, of a relationship, I think has, has led to each of the, each of these tracks being more complex and richer, us actually being able to create more time to invent and do something new because, you know, the baseline stuff uh, is already there because we just know each other. There's a lot of trust is what I wanted to say. We trust Colin and I hope he trusts us. And that goes a long way too. You know, we've, we've become fond of each other in addition to fond of, you know, what we, what we create. And so we enjoy spending time together. And the great thing uh, that, um, that Colin offers is uh, collaboration and accessibility. And he, he wants to interact with us and he's passionate about sound and he's passionate about what we do. And that ultimately benefits the films, we feel. One of the things that I think really w w was a highlight of, of film three, but was growing and growing for me throughout all three films, <clears throat> was um, Colin's in, in involvement in allowing us to put our best foot forward and then coming in and working with us to craft the track. and for people that don't know what we do, I think that is a huge part of what we do because we're all very good at what we do, but Colin knows the story and he knows how to use sound to, to help tell the story. And we can present all this great stuff that, you know, all this cool sound design that, that Al has created and cleaned up dialogue and the music just presented beautifully. But until, Colin sort of puts his eye on it and ear on it and then and then works with us in a way that just feels so much part of a team and part of a, a common goal to make this the best it can be is huge. And, and I have to say, from my perspective, it's it's rare these days because directors are hit with so much in post-production. And the fact that Colin gave us the time he gave us makes the track triple what it would have been otherwise. So that's a great, that's a great way to, to describe it. Colin, I, I'd love to just kind of dig into a little bit about uh, what Al and, and Chris are saying, you know, safety, not guaranteed, you know, obviously a very small film. And then you immediately jumped into, into Jurassic world, but even on safety, not guaranteed sound is a really important part of the experience of that film. And, and obviously not a lot of, of low budget indie filmmakers get to work, you know, with the Skywalker sound team. So how, where did you learn how to use sound as a storytelling tool? Where did that, where did that, how did you develop that skill as a director? I don't know if any of us really know where we learned anything. It, it does. It comes from a set of instincts. I was very, um, very much involved in music when I was growing up. I grew up in the Bay Area, so I always had this fascination with Skywalker Ranch as this mythical place that maybe someday I would go, and my dad would, you know, point across the water, and say, "That's where. That's where they do it all, right over there." And uh, and I, I was in the opera when I was a little kid, and uh, and and I got to see, you know, stagecraft, but also, you know musical stagecraft, uh, you know, those, you know, nothing uses sound to tell story like opera. And so to be able to, to experience that, uh, in a very formative age, uh, and then, you know, kind of lean into music and acting and performance myself before I even got into filmmaking. Um, I think that, you know, understanding how, how the music and the dialogue uh, and the effects, you know, these three key elements, uh, are going to work together and, and what you need to lean into at any given time. Nobody's really taught that. Nobody really knows it. It's just sort of something you feel while you're, you know, while you're looking at the story that, that you're attempting to tell. And, and I think over time, you know, listening to, to all these guys uh, and, and Gwen uh, and how they felt about any given moment, 
I, I, I do, if I would say I have any ability, it's, it's taking other people's superpowers and, and trying to like, uh, you know, put them into my brain. I'm like that superhero who doesn't actually have any powers of their own. I just like collect the other ones. Uh, and so I just took all their superpowers and, and put them in my own brain and, and then try to switch between them and think like them having, you know, heard the way that they think. How does the process start for you guys, uh, on, on the Jurassic world films? Are you guys looking at, uh, Colin, do you, do you show them the script before you go off and shoot or is, you know, how do you, how do you approach the collaboration with them from the beginning? Um, I did. You did read the script right Al. this time. Absolutely. We, we always get the um, script first, which is a yeah. huge treat, especially on this film, but really on all my films, I'm, I'm not as secretive as I think the other franchises are with the people who we're working with, you know, outside of, of that group. No, but um, I, all of the actors read the whole script. Sound team reads the whole script. Cinematographer, every you know, camera department, they really do uh, need an understanding of what we're trying to achieve on a macro level uh, in order to be able to do the day to day and, and get into the micro. So, what's advantageous here is that Al and everyone are able to get a sense of what kinds of sounds they should be collecting, you know, far in advance. And there's always going to be a team that'll go out and realize, okay, we have the, the most vast library of sounds on the planet, but we don't have this, this, and this. Uh, and they'll go out and make it. I'm actually, Al, curious if there's anything specific on this film that you read the script, realized you didn't have, and went out and got? Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things we have to do early on as well is we actually have to know a lot of what these dinosaurs are going to sound like before, sometimes before we even see them, you know, uh, and that's something you and I have needed to collaborate on for things like marketing and, you know, all the things that are going to happen two years later, but they want to know what's it sound like now? So the benefit of reading the script, um, I make a list of all the new dinosaurs and the convenient thing is that, you know, at this point we've had all of our favorite dinosaurs so far. We know what they sound like. We know roughly how they were made. So it's okay. Well, now we've got a Therizinosaurus. What's that going to sound like? Now we've got a Troceraptors. And again, back to this whole, you know, ability to be able to communicate and collaborate with Colin is uh, I'm able to reach out to Colin and say, okay, let's talk about the Atrociraptors. And Colin will give a, a description of what he envisions them to be and sound like. And then from that, I'll make a list of things that we would like to record. So for example, you mentioned for the Atrociraptors, you know, maybe wolves and maybe pit bulls, you know, they're kind of, they're gnarly, you know, aggressors. So that goes on the list. And then things like there is in a you know, it's more predator like it's communicating. It's, uh, it's using um, sonar to, to communicate and to gather information. So we talked about ravens and crows and, you know, pilot lights and all these cool clicky things. So that goes on the list. And then, yeah. So between uh, let's see, spring of 2020, and th that following year, we were gathering and, and collecting all kinds of great new sounds. And sometimes it's just, oh, here's an opportunity. A friend reached out and said, I'm going to go out into uh, the eastern desert. I forget, some, some valley uh, in the eastern desert of California to record mules. I was like, yeah, that sounds cool. And he got some crazy sounds. So, um, you know, mules, stallions, wolves, foxes, you know all kinds of other birds and stuff. So we always want to collect a whole new arsenal and then we, you know, we play with it, but it's, it's all based on Colin's, you know, explanation and direction about what these creatures are going to sound like and, and what their personality is. I just want to note in a, in a movie that's about predators and prey, Al was referring to uh, the John McTiernan movie Predator. Uh, and the character in it, yes, uh, not not just any old predator. Just, it's a very specific reference yes, uh, for, the, the for a dinosaur. dinosaur. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for but sure. We did our own thing with it. I want to talk a little bit more about the process of creating the dinosaur sounds. Obviously, that's a huge part of any conversation about the sound about a Jurassic uh, film. And I got to sit down with uh, the man himself, Gary Rydstrom, uh, last week, and we kind of took a listen back to the original film from 1993 and, and talk about the creation <clears throat> process for the dinosaurs. So, I mean, how, you know, Chris, obviously, you know, Jurassic Park, this whole franchise has been a huge part of your career going back from, you know, you were, you were a, a sound effects re recordist on, on the very first one. I'm curious, like how, you know, how are you guys keeping this fresh as all these new dinosaurs come out? What's, what's the process of finding new sounds for the new dinosaurs? I mean, uh, you know, for me, it's a handoff in a way in that, you know, I'm 
I'm the mix, I'm the re-recording mixer handling the sound effects and of course Al's sound design. Um, so it, 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 it's fresh for me because I've been making creature sounds for a long, long time now. And to, to watch, uh, I'll be tortured by it and then come up with some great stuff. It's really a lot of fun. Uh, and, and then, you know, of course there is, um, there are components in the design that really actually come from recordings that I made when I was a kid. And so it's, um, it goes back to the origins of when I started, uh, and being mentored by Gary Rydstrom and, 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 and having some real luck in, in a couple of recordings that, you know, if, if you listen to them, you say, Oh, I know exactly what that is. And, uh, and then, and then to go forward to the sixth film in the, in the franchise and see where Al's taking it. It's just a tremendous amount of fun. And, and as a mixer, um, yeah, I have a huge responsibility. Um, and, and also I have a lot of the stress taken off my back because quite often I'm the sound designer and the mixer and that that's a tough seat to sit in. And so on a film this complicated, uh, you know, to, to have Al, you know, hel helming the, the design is, um, it's every single film is fresh and every single film is a new exploration in, in the sound of dinosaurs and, and, and ha it has to be said just briefly that it's not only about the dinosaurs. There's some great scenes um, maybe being chased by a dinosaur that, that have other elements in there, like really cool motorcycles and really cool planes and, you know, cracking ice ponds and all of this great stuff. So the whole thing, uh, this, this film is a celebration on many, many different levels. Chris, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, there's some key sequences that I wanted to ask you all about. And I think probably at the top of that list is the Malta sequence. Um, you know, you, you start off with having this, Colin, the way you wrote this was just amazing. This this sort of like the, 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 the black market, the flea market for the dinosaurs. And then, of course, the raptors get out and this amazing chase sequence through the streets of, of Malta. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the approach to crafting that scene? And, and Gwen and Pete, I, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear from you guys about sort of the, the challenges of the, you know, I, I know there was a lot of dialogue work uh, going on through that sequence as well. Well, for, I mean, yeah, the, the, the crafting of it was, was really to, it was kind of breaking the language of these movies in a lot of ways when it came to the way that we shot Malta and then the sound design of Malta. And that we've, we tended to, you know, all of us who live in the shadow of Steven Spielberg as filmmakers who, you know, have been charged with making sequels to one of the greatest movies ever made tend to lean into the language of that film and, and our camera glides and we, we do five point dolly moves and all that stuff that, that Steven is so good at. Uh, I want, I felt like at this point we, we, maybe we had earned uh, the opportunity to just like shatter it. And so when we go to Malta, suddenly it's handheld. Uh, the, the camera is on other moving vehicles, just trying to capture the action as it happens. Uh, you feel the human energy behind the camera work. And I think that translated into the sound. It's, it's just so dirty and visceral uh, and, and real and, and bone crunching. And uh, I think as, as that sequence came together and it, it actually very fortunately, it didn't change that much over the time that we were working on it, that it, it kind of locked together in a way that everybody was able to really focus on, on, on its flow. Cause you are, you're tracking two totally different, you know, points of action, you know, within the same city. And, and at one point, you know, they cross over, uh, so it was, it was just one of the great, you know, collaborations I think that all of us uh, have ever been involved in together uh, just because of its complexity uh, and, and also just how excited we were about it. I'm thinking about like the, um, the dinosaur market scene, for instance, is, is a, a place, you know, Gwen did an incredible job of um, providing all the different languages. It's a, it's a place where people from all over the world are coming together. And so there, there's not just English or Maltese or whatever, but every language. And you know, Gwen can speak to, you know, the Loop Group and all that. Um, f for me and for Chris, when it gets to us, it, it's kind of a kitchen sink. It has it has all of the voices. It has all of the dinosaurs, and all of their voices, and all of the other sounds that are going on. And I think one thing that um, we take for granted when you know as humans when we walk into a chaotic environment our brains are actually mixing that environment for us we're, what we choose to focus on determines what we're actually hearing and um so 
in, in a theater, we have to do that for the audience. If we just put all the sound in, then you don't hear anything because it's chaotic and our, our brains are not able to do that in a theatrical setting. Um, so, you know, as, as mixers, Chris and I are, are uh, collaborating, you know, trading off, okay, this is a moment for dialogue. This is a moment for, um, you know, dinosaurs. And then in the midst of it, somehow there's an orchestra playing. And so <laughs> we have to also make uh, uh, room for themes that, which are incredibly important to how you experience the scene and feel about it. Um, so, so that's the challenge. And honestly, the excitement of, of doing a scene like that is you have everything at your fingertips and you have to decide what in each moment. And it really is just moment by moment by moment. What are we hearing here? What are we hearing here? So it's really fun. We got to spend um, uh, some time just kind of carving that scene. And one of the things that was really fun, and it was just, it was just the four of us uh, sound people in the room and we were trying to figure out how to draw our eye in the way that Pete was speaking. And so Gwen had this arsenal of, of different languages and different call outs. And we'd, we'd go by, you know, the lady chopping the thing and, you know, she would create a conversation for that. And then, but we wanted to hear why our eye is drawn over here. So she'd throw out some whatever. And it was all just, you know, undecipherable, but in a way it had all of this energy. And I, I love that, that very frenetic pass through of the, of the market. And I think a lot of those shout outs and languages and, and just that energy um, is, is supported by all of that great, you know, all of those great loop group performances. No, it was really, fun. I love doing the, uh, the foreign language stuff. It always sounds more exotic than English because it is, but the other part of it is even through the whole bike chase. I mean, the motorcycles and the raptors and stuff, you still hear your heroes. You never lose track of them. You hear, you know, Owen struggling with the bike. You hear Claire ducking. You hear, you know, just a little bit of a shriek here, shriek there. It's not constant, but that also keeps you connected with the characters through this whole chaotic scene, which I also love the little, boop, 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 boop. oh, pay attention. This is our hero. Follow them kind of thing. So, Gwen, I loved uh, hearing you talk about that. Can you talk a little bit about, I mean, how were the production tracks and what did, what uh, what were the challenges that you had from a dialogue edit editorial standpoint? How much ADR did you have to do? This is obviously, it's a, on a big film like this, it's difficult sometimes to get good, clean production dialogue. Actually, the production was, was really pretty good. We didn't do a lot of... I mean, we added a lot of breaths and efforts, which is, which is typical, um, just to make sure we can cut through. But as far as the actual lines... Colin did a very, very good job on the set. Thank you very much. And I'm sure the actors thank you too. But we really didn't do a lot of technical ADR. It was either changing of lines or adding lines or adding a little bit of this or, um, again, tons and tons and tons of loop group just for the, the languages and stuff. But there are also huge scenes where, okay, I guess there's one scene that we had to get. They had an animatronic bug. And it was it was um, uh, Laura, Dern, Laura Dern and uh, Sam Neill, and they were, they were talking over the, this, this bug in the beginning. That scene probably had the most ADR because... And we were able to uh, salvage, you know, some production and and trade off. So it's it's not exclusively no. ADR or production. We we're able to do, and that, that's the skill of the dialogue editors. And, and the mixer. <laughs> And and, then, and uh, yeah, but uh, and it's also the the trade off of having this awesome animatronic there, you know. So I, I think it's worth it, but it definitely takes a little effort. But for instance, the kids screaming—that's all production. That's all production when they're being chased by those bugs. That was yeah, that was was beautifully done. I would. I have a question for you, Gwen. Is how I feel like I tend to obviously lean toward production as much as possible, which could lead toward a, a track that you know that feels you know incomplete or flawed in a way at times. And I and I appreciate how how willing everybody is to let those imperfections exist because uh, I think movies are so slick these days and everything sounds absolutely flawless. And I think the moments that aren't flawless uh, actually make us feel like you know the characters are really alive and we're with them. Uh, so I, I thank you for that. Well, I mean, it really helps that your production sound on the set was very usable. I mean, so it works both ways. <laughs> yeah. Be a good team. Be a good team. I'm glad uh, uh, that you guys brought up the the, uh, the locust scene. And, and as Chris pointed out, there's a lot of great sound moments in this film that are not necessarily dinosaur related. But the that first sequence uh, where we reveal the locusts and they chase the kids into the barn, it's just terrifying. And I'd love to hear how you guys approached the sound design uh, and the mix of that sequence, because it really just was uh, just a visceral, just terrifying scene. 
it, it, it reads that way in the script, which is fantastic. I remember being so excited reading that scene going, is this a Jurassic movie? You know, what is this? This is, it's almost like a horror film, you know, in, in the way it read. And it's just such a great uh, diversion from our normal creature design, uh, you know, a welcome diversion. Um, and this was one of the things where we got to work on the design early on. And um, I, I can't remember exactly what, uh, you know, whenever Colin describes something, it's either from some musical point of view or from some story, you know, it's never a literal thing. It's always a great, you know, description. And it was something like an a, organic, you know, destruction mechanism or something, you know, he wanted this, this organic destruction thing coming at us. And so we, um, we use lots of layers, you know, obviously you think, okay, well, we'll just go to insects sounds and pitch them down. And it never, you know, and it, it, again, the, the literal approach never really works. So it was uh, a lot of, a lot of different sounds that you might not normally use um, things like wood chittering and, you know, bowing and chick, 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 you know, a lot of that sort of scratchy sound, goopy stuff. Colin was a big fan of the goopy stuff. Um, so liquidy kind of things that just sound kind of gruesome and um, frogs, you know. Um, and then uh, one of the best secret ingredients. Is, so Pete also did a good chunk of design on this film. And Pete brought one of the best parts of it that made it feel just such a, a huge swarm. And that was Pete Horner. A swarm. <laughs> he brought the swarm. Uh, I I uh, have kept bees in the past, and uh, I have a recording with an ambisonic mic that I put inside the hive, and uh, just got this kind of terrifying. It's it's the thing that it's a visceral reaction for humans. I think when you hear a swarm of bees, and uh, you know, so so we uh, definitely used that as as part of it. But I think it's it's a great example of. This really was a full-on collaboration because you know that's just a, one of the elements, one of the pieces of glue. But it really w requires all this other stuff, and and Al brought a lot of that, and, and Benny Burt and it was part of that, and um, and others. So one of my favorite things that that you all did was once the kids are inside the barn, uh, there's the moment when you know this this wave of locusts is coming at them, and then it basically you know a bunch of them are hitting the front of the barn, and then the rest are are going around the sides. And I remember saying it's you know it's a rock in a river, uh, and so the sound when you're in that space of like the the hive flowing around you, but knowing that there's there's a place of resistance too, and you're just hitting, hearing all these impacts until one breaks through. Uh, it's it's a it's a really scary piece of design. I'll just add to the to the locust scene. That was one of the more difficult scenes for me to mix in the film because it, it starts so simply, which is really fun. But by the time it's done, the amount of layers that Al delivered me and the intensity that it builds to was really brutal mixing. And and uh, to to uh, I have to say, I mean, I'm very. I'm very proud of what we ended up with, but it was that was a really brutal section of the mix. And um, so, are you are you saying it was it was brutal just in, in terms of keeping it articulate and like keeping keeping it building, or how, how how do you mean? When you build a sequence like that, you have to um, you have to dig in deep, and 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 it's loud, it's intense, and it needs to it needs to grow in that intensity. So for the effects mixer, it can be it could be a sequence where you turn around and everybody's left the room and you're just sitting there all by yourself getting beat up <laughs> and Al's back chuckling saying, aha, <laughs> usually he was with me though, but, um, More stuff, Chris. More stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's a great Dolby Atmos, uh, moment by the way, Glenn, uh, because it, it really, the way that, Colin constructed it and the sounds that Al and, and Pete built gave me the ability to, to move things around us in a way that, that the ear can actually track in a very difficult sequence for the ear to track. So we could use frequencies to, to delineate what's flying around us and what's impacting the, the barn and whatnot. Um, and, and it was, it, 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 you know, I remember the outside 
before the kids run and we cut to a side shot of the swarm lifting up. And that's one of my favorite moments because up until then we've sort of been playing with what are these things? Are they? And suddenly you hear the volume and, and, and this sort of low frequency thrum of this thing, which then delivers us to, you know, the kids running and, and then their experience inside the barn. Um, yeah, really fun to mix and, and also, uh, you know, a, a rough one to, to, to get through to get it to the place where it was. I think we were lucky that it was kids because the frequency of the kids screaming versus adult screaming would not have been able to probably cut through the sound of that swarm. And then also once you have a bucket uh, on top of this uh, insect that the bucket's metal. And so you're, you're able to differentiate the sound of like its head hitting the inside of the bucket, you know, with its legs on the outside, kids screaming, and then, you know, the rock in the river. Uh, one of the things I love about uh, about the film, and uh, to me, it calls back to the original Jurassic Park, is this notion that that you guys play with a bit about us. You know, we often hear the dinosaurs before we see them, which I think is a key part of like the suspense. And and Colin, I, f- I feel like that that's even you know part of the DNA of, of Spielberg going back to Jaws. Is you know we have that we have that audio presence before the creature actually shows up. And I, I you know the 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 scenes in the underground tunnels in in Jurassic World Dominion. I think are, are a great example of that. But Colin, can you talk a bit about like uh, that that process of of designing moments where we hear before we see? You know, Stephen did that on a on a more macro scale with the movie, and that you know you you talk about the dinosaurs, you 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 just tease them. There's shadows until finally, you know, you get the prestige, you get to actually see it. And uh, we didn't really have that advantage of this movie. There's there's dinosaurs all over, like right when it starts. Uh, so we didn't have that slow build. But I think that in the context of individual scenes to have that slow build and thinking of just the early scenes, you know, when Claire and, uh, and Daniela's character walk into that industrial farm, you hear the sounds. There's, there's obviously, you know, a bunch of small dinosaurs in here before you see them. Uh, when Maisie sees the apatosaurus is in the snow in the, at the lumber yard, you hear them first. Uh, you know, likewise with, with most of it, but then when you get, uh, all the way to Claire, uh, with the Dilophosaurus, uh, we know that sound. And so we know exactly what's going to happen to her uh, way before she knows it. So it's one of those moments when sound can let the audience be ahead of the character, uh, which is, which is a cool trick to play normally in screenwriting. You don't want to do that. But uh, I, I liked that moment uh, for, for our, like our preconceived understanding of, of, of what that, what that sound meant. Fantastic. Colin, I feel like you, uh, you, you really put a, uh, Bryce Dallas Howard through hell and back on these films. Uh, she really just, oh my gosh. And of course, like you eject her out of a plane in this one, that sequence is terrifying. And then she's, you know, she's crawling around in the, the jungle. And then, and then just, I, I, to me, this is going to become an iconic shot, which is her hiding in, you know, in the pond with the, the dinosaur coming down. And I, I just love this. The I'd love to hear about the approach to the sound design of that particular sequence. Cause it's just so, it's like, it's not bombastic the way we normally think of big dinosaur, you know, sequences, but it's just specific and perfect. Thank you. Well, I, I, I that's my favorite sequence. I love Malta. It's awesome. But like, there's something about what we all achieved there when you, uh, the, the group involved. And I, I mean, you know, this crew, uh, you know, John and everyone on camera, our production designer, you know, our gaffer, like the way the light looked, there's so many things about that sequence uh, that work. And then ultimately, you know, Bryce, uh, that it was an opportunity for, for she and I, we called it our drum solo, uh, that at that point in the concert, uh, and we, I tried to structure this whole movie, uh, like, like a concert. And then like the first half, uh, you know, you hear a lot of the new album, but they're smart and they pepper in some of the hits to make sure you know where you're going. Uh, and then, it, and then at this point in the movie, you know, huge drum solo, and then it's just, you know, the greatest hits to the end, uh, from there. Uh, but you know, she, her and I just having the opportunity to to just do this really singular sequence, a person and a dinosaur, to have it be largely silent, definitely no dialogue, uh, uh, her having to remain silent in order to survive. Uh, and then her, you know, she, she's been through a lot, but she's also changed a lot and evolved a lot as a character. And it felt like that was the moment where, where you almost think about it while you're watching the movie. Like, wow, I remember when she was like, you know, working in this corporate environment at the beginning of this. And now she's going underwater in this, you know, and like apocalypse Claire uh, to survive. Uh, it was it was thrilling for us. And I, and I love where we landed on, on the sounds that this animal makes. We suggest that he can't see very well. 
Uh, and so it, 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 you know, relies on echolocation. And so you hear these clicks uh, and these echoes that actually sound like it's throwing its voice. You don't know where it's coming from. And so when it shows up behind her, and you guys can probably go into this better than I can, but you know, we use we use the room and the mix to make sure the audience were they were pretty sure it was back there, it was over there, and then suddenly it's here, and that's the one place you didn't hear a sound from, which was I thought that was pretty neat. One thing about Bryce is, uh, you know, for temps and, and uh, you know, uh, just playback stuff, we cheated in all her breaths, like when she's, you know, in the ejection seat and then when she lands in the tree and the, the thing comes by her. So we had a bunch of stuff in there. And so when she came in to do the ADR, I said, you know, I just want, you know, we cheated a bunch of stuff and I just want you to hear it. And she said, oh, you did a really great job. But there's a story there with the breaths and she redid them all and she redid all the breaths because she wanted, she, when she was acting it, she knew what she was doing and, and, it, and she made it so much better. And so I love her for that too. Yeah, her performance, her, her truly terrified and performance is, you know, the center of that scene and, you know, being able to just create the environment around that and where she's looking and where, and how she's acting is, um, is, is such an important part of that. Um, what was fun was that we were given the freedom to kind of, move things around because it's something uh we hadn't thought about initially you know it was just okay it's here and you know we're always very specific about okay where do we put this sound where does it go where does it go and then you know when colin brought up the idea that you know let's disorient the, the environment and and you know the people watching it and so being able to start playing with those echoes and those delays i think created this really fun uh, atmosphere and 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 made it even more terrifying. And specifically, the the sounds, and this comes to the creature design, which is great, is that the sounds we are able to put to attach to it, and the sounds that it creates, um, go with it visually. You see the way, that, and and you know this is the challenging part about uh, making sounds for these these newer films is that the visuals are just so stunningly, you know, accurate and believable. And the way the nostrils move and the way the mouth just just nudges a little bit. And so, you know, we're in, in many ways, we're, we're cutting ADR for these dinosaurs that, you know, creating a language and then cutting ADR. Uh, but it, it gave us such a, a, a new creative approach to what a dinosaur can sound like. That's one of my favorite sequences. I think you just hit a, a major home run there with your sound design. And one thing that you did as well, and I'm assuming that you and Colin uh, kind of talked about this, is that there's sounds coming from the, the th Therizinosaurus that you don't actually see something from his nostrils or his mouth or anything. He's emanating this from his, he or she, from, from the body. And, and then those sounds are traveling out into the world and, and that's how this creature is figuring out the environment and how to see with sound and, and uh, talk, talk a little bit about that. I'm sort of curious. It, it comes from the concept that we discussed early on, which is that it's using echolocation. And from there, it's more about what kind of sounds do animals make when they're doing that things like dolphins and um, bats. And, you know, we, we were using some bird sounds like ravens, uh, I, again, you know, the collaboration with Colin, he'll send me some YouTube videos. He's like, go to one minute, 37 seconds right there. Listen, you hear that? That is awesome. You know, that's an idea. of, And so there's this back and forth. And so then you, you know, that's the seed and you run with that. And then you start to kind of play with sounds that, um, that sound similar or, you know, start to play with animals. So marine mammals, you know, played a lot with that, uh, played with birds and, um, you know, but but by not feeling so tied to the mouth and playing more with the story and what the animal is actually, you know, what what the point of the story is, allows you to kind of move away from that more literal approach, and out of that comes some some fun serendipity. I think that you know that's a scene that's I think a favorite of all of ours, and what's great about it, it why it's a good example too, is it has to be the sound was thought about in the writing process. You can't have a scene like that unless it goes all the way back to the beginning, uh, you know, the conception of the scene. 
is about sound. And, you know, whenever you do that, you just, you give us a playground, you know, to make something cool. And, you know, I love Al's design for that creature and, you know, but, but it really comes back to and the writer in the room saying, what can we do? I, I agree with that. I, I actually, I remember, I don't think I put it in the script, but the idea that it was so quiet that we can hear a deer eating a leaf, <laughs> which we do. And we do. Uh, <laughs> in that moment, but like that silence and when it's like munching on its little berries right there, uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's such an intimate sound. And yet uh, it, the, the image is, is so massive that I think it, it makes it scarier. Yeah, for sure. Because you, it, when those quiet moments happen, you know that something, you know, it's a precursor to something big and dramatic coming. And speaking of big and dramatic, of course, uh, we have to discuss the, the 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 big dinosaur battle at the end. Not one, not two, but three of them going at each other. Uh, can you talk a little bit about designing that sequence and especially in the mix, just keeping it, you know, articulate and keeping it from getting overwhelming? I'll, I'll throw it to you guys. I, I guess my, my only, the, the conversation I remember having is, you know, we are, we are just getting to the helicopter to get out of a, of a, a country that's collapsing. Uh, you know, that sense that we are uh, staying with our characters from their perspective and the war is happening in the background. Like there's moments when the camera is only seeing the feet of the dinosaurs moving behind them and this massive battle is happening. Uh, but we're focused on, you know, Jeff Goldblum lifting up BD Wong and, you know, with their help to, to get him to the helicopter. Uh, and so I think keeping that sense of this is from the human's perspective uh, until the humans leave. Uh, in the helicopter, and then it turns to the dinosaur's perspective. That was that was kind of the overall, and then you know you all took it from there. I, I think Pete could could chime in. I think one of the things that works really well throughout that sequence is what Giacchino did with the structure of the score, and um, you know we, the way it it starts very kind of. Um, quiet and dramatic as we see these two warriors come into battle and the way you allow Colin for us to kind of pull back and go into this sort of subjective moment and the music really supports all that. The way he, he did that piano moment is just phenomenal. So I, I think Pete, why don't you speak some more about the score through there in the mix? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that's a, a, a critical part of it is is the score and also you know we have a, a great team of music editors working with us who help us uh craft that and um but yeah that michael left some space uh for uh moments he knows not to hit right on the the moment where sound ha is going to hit you know so leaving the space for everyone to play in the same um scene is is kind of critical and and you know mixing the music i'm really i have my ear to the themes and i want to make sure that those are heard because that's you know really important um but i think it also uh is a great example of you know chris is so good at uh pushing and pulling on the effects and and making room um you know knowing what's important and what's not important um in in any given moment and you know that's you know those dinosaurs are dancing with each other and Chris and I are dancing with each other and uh, you know it's uh, everything comes together and everything wants to be heard and you know we just have to find a way to make that happen one of the things I really love in that sequence is how when we cut into when we cut into Gwen space when we're in you know Dewanda inside a bubble in this helicopter it's the only person you can hear at all everybody else is it's just bombast all around them and every now and then you cut inside this thing and and she's just kind of running commentary. <laughs> on the whole thing as it happens, uh, even while in a, in a helicopter that's running. And so it's, it's just nice to be able to hear from one human uh, amidst all that insanity. Well, I'm glad that you guys brought up uh, Michael Giacchino's score because I wanted to, to ask about that as well. Colin, I feel like one of the things that, that, you, that you're trying to balance in this film is obviously by bringing the original cast back and having them be part of this film, you know, you're, 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 you're balancing nostalgia with taking the story in a bold new direction. And I'm curious about your conversations with Giacchino about that, because obviously there are some callbacks to, I mean, what is obviously the iconic original John Williams score. And we get some taste about, we get a little taste of that, but, but Giacchino is also, also pushing this in a really bold new direction. Can you talk a little bit about your collaboration with Michael and, and how the music came together for the film? Uh, sure. I mean, we had the same philosophy about it. And I, I would say if you, 
you know, I'm sure someone will go through the movie and, and pick out every single, you know, callback to anything from a previous film. But if you did it, you probably wouldn't come up with that many more uh, than Michael created John Williams based musical moments. He does it very judiciously, very carefully. He's really reserved uh, as I am because to us, to a certain extent, it's not that it's easy, but it is a little easy to be able to throw John Williams music on and feel something because it's so incredible and it reminds us of, of our childhoods and things that are that are really warm and, and comfortable for us. So for us to, to treat it uh, as something that is bold and new, but then no, uh, what we, I remember what I, we talked about once was the idea that if, if you have like a really uh, bold meal at an exciting restaurant and they're just throwing a lot of new flavors at you that, that you're like, you're, you're pretty, you, you respect them intellectually, but you're not sure if you love them yet. And there's a lot going on. And then they bring you like a really good piece of just bread and butter. Uh, and so when John Williams shows up, that's your, that's your really good warm bread and butter. And it, it makes you feel, uh, all, all warm inside. That's a great way to, <laughs> to, to talk about it. Uh, I'd love to just wrap up with my final question. I know that COVID had a huge impact on the film. Uh, you know, Colin, I, I know that, that you guys were really one of the first films to, to, to kind of resume shooting after being shut down for a long time. And there, I've, I've read that, you know, you established these incredible protocols and bubbled the cast in a hotel and really kind of made a, a very safe space. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, with a complicated film like this, just that added huge layers of complexity to it. But I'd love to hear about how, you know, you guys continued your collaboration through COVID and through lockdowns and, and, and did it, you know, did it complicate things? Did it open up some possibilities for you? It, it, yes. And yes. I mean, it, it definitely complicated things. It opens up, opened up opportunities throughout production because we were all able to live, we were living together. So we were working together and writing together. And, and even when things went, uh, went impossible, we we found a possibility in that. And we, we weren't able to go to Malta to do certain things, but we, you know, we created this, a set that was extraordinary that made us feel like we were there. And by the time we got to Skywalker, I went to Skywalker for, you know, a good amount of time. I was there, you know, kind of forever, uh, cause partially cause I love it. Uh, and it's why I make movies so I can go spend four to six weeks at Skywalker ranch. Uh, and, and yet, uh, during that time, you know, I, I haven't seen all of your faces since 2018. And, you know, we, we were still, you know, we were in these rooms and we were following the protocols and it was uncomfortable and it's, it's, it's not the best way to work. And I know we were all hoping it was the last time, but what amazed me about it at every stage is, is how, uh, People manage to to power through that uh, and and just be so excited to be working, so excited to be doing what we love, as opposed to sitting at home going crazy. Uh, that I think, in some ways, it, it motivated us to do our best work because we were just thrilled to be there, and we were reminded of why we love doing this in the first place because it was taken away from us for a second. We also did, you know, these crazy tent mixes between London and and the ranch. So we'd get up at four in the morning. Colin would stay late to like after midnight just because the time changed. And the whole, just the the technology of making that work between the engineers at the ranch and the people in London is just mind blowing because we were playing back in sync and, and, and mixing together in completely different time zones and countries and across the world. And that um, that is still just, the fact that we can do that is amazing. And we did it a lot. <laughs> I want to make sure I understand what, what what was happening. So you guys were at the ranch temping and Colin, were you, you were in London, but you were sitting on a mixing stage. How did that? Okay. Yes. I was on a stage, um, uh, at Delane Lee, uh, in Soho and they were all, you know, in our room at the ranch and we were able to, we were communicating. If I remember it right, we we're communicating like on zoom just so we could hear each other talk. And so we all had our computers set up and we could talk to each other that way. And then I was hearing, you know, the live mix in the room that maybe had a slight delay, but, but, you know, we made it work. Uh, and I, I didn't want it to work too well. Cause then I was afraid that if the studio found out they wouldn't fly me to Skywalker ranch anymore. So I was like, it's working, but it's, it's just barely good enough. We're going to need to go there. Well, I think there's something to be said for, I mean, it was incredible what the engineering team at Skywalker did. And we, we had, you know, HD image and surround sound uh, with a less than a second. I think it was like a third of a second latency. I think Zoom actually had a longer latency than our, our, our synchronization system. So in that sense, it was incredible and we could do everything in real time, essentially. But the one thing, you know, that about Colin, uh, his collaborative nature is that when he's in the room with you, he'll give a note to somebody and then 
while they're doing the note, he turns to somebody else and, you know, whispers in their ear and then turns to somebody else. And so, you know, he, he's keeping everybody sort of uh, their inbox full and uh, and moving. And that's harder to do with, you know, Zoom, because when we hit play, it mutes our communication. And when he hits stop, it opens up again. So nothing happens, you know, in between, which, you know, that, that, that's what we love is being in the room together. I think uh, it's worth noting some people may not know what a temp mix is. And um, it, it's worth talking about just briefly because a temp mix is, is something that we used to do in the old days all the time. And on a lot of films, filmmakers don't do it anymore. And the value of what we were able to achieve on the temp mix made the final mix when Colin was actually physically with us that much more productive. And uh, I, I, I just want to speak to that because I, I think uh, – Filmmakers should realize the value of sitting with their crew early on before the final mix and, and what the dividends that that pay off, that, 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 you know, how that pays off when, when you get to the final mix. I agree with that. But also, I don't I don't I think temp mix is probably the wrong word for it. We might want to rename it because to me, it's like a first draft of a screenplay or it's 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 not like we're throwing everything away that we did in, in that mix. And so we're, we're, you know, we're creating a layer that we're then going to iron over and iron over over again. But the foundation for the mix was was built then. So I, I feel like we're offending it by calling it a temp. Very yeah, we should yeah, stop using that term because maybe people will let us do it more often. The, the first draft yeah, of the mix. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's if I'm a studio person, I'm like, well, what am I paying for? It's just temp. You're just gonna throw it away. You're like, no, it's it's found the foundational mix. Yeah. Like, give it a brand it. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I know uh, Al from something that we had talked about previously. Like one of the technical challenges where you guys are streaming Dolby Atmos for these temps, right? To go to Delaney. Lee. So you guys, are, so you're you're working natively in Atmos from the beginning, and that was part of like just the design and the build of this track, right? Yeah, I mean the first one we we just do five one because uh, again we're just getting the structure going, uh, but from there on we move into native Atmos. So everything is live real time, and especially for something like this because there there's so many moving parts. Having that all be virtual and able to be manipulated, and and the way Colin works, which is very much you know, a moment to moment where can we do this with this? Can we do this with this? You don't want to say, well, that's tied to this and it's printed. No, everything is live and available. And, uh, and, you know, at a certain point we were back, Colin was back in London and we were here and we were streaming, uh, streaming Atmos flawlessly. Colin, I'm curious from your standpoint as a filmmaker and a storyteller, what, what narrative options are opened up for you by Dolby Atmos? What does that do to the audience? I think actually the one we mentioned earlier is a perfect example that, you know, the, the locus sequence, uh, the, the sense uh, that we were inside a box with, you know, a wave of, 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 you know, these insects moving all around us and, and having impacts all around us. That's not something that in 5.1 is going to have anywhere near the, the storytelling value uh, as something that's going over you and around you and, and behind you at the same time. And, and it's not exclusively things like that. Uh, but I think when it, you know, when it comes to our dinosaur movies specifically, uh, there's a tremendous advantage, uh, in being able to, to place the audience into what I consider kind of a 3d space, uh, sonically. Uh, and, uh, it's, it's not just 360, like it's, it's, it's immersive to a level where, uh, it feels like your ears and, you know, you, you can recognize sounds coming from any specific direction. Direction. And uh, I think we've been so used to to our sounds being somewhat directional in movie theaters for so long that uh, when you go in now, whether you whether you literally notice or not, like I'm sure the general audience just you know feels that much more involved in the movie, whether they know why or not. And that actually think that's a, it's it's great that we can be that discreet. Uh, with Atmos and the way that we're mixing it, that they're not like looking behind their shoulder and being like, "What was that?" It's you know, it's just all happening. That's a great way to put it. Well, I think uh, we'll wrap up with that. Uh, I really appreciate you all taking the time to talk with us about Jurassic World Dominion. Con congratulations on finishing this film and bringing it out into the world. Colin, Gwen, Al, Chris, Pete, really appreciate you coming on the Dolby Podcast, Dan, talking to us about the film. Nice to see you. Thanks, Glenn. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Thank you. Team, this team. Well, thank you once again to Colin, Al, Gwen, Pete, and Chris today for joining us for this deep dive conversation into Jurassic World Dominion. As I'm sure you can appreciate with all of these very busy artists, it's a lot of work to juggle the schedule 
to put these conversations together. So we're very grateful to our friends at Universal and at Skywalker Sound for making these artists available for this conversation. Before you go, please make sure you are subscribed to us, the Dolby Institute podcast. We've got some big episodes coming up soon and you will not want to miss what we've got coming up for you. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts via the links in our show notes or simply by searching for Dolby wherever you get your podcasts. Until then, thanks again for joining us. This has been Sound and Image Lab brought to you by the Dolby Institute. I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. Our producer and editor is Michael Coleman. Our executive producers are Amanda Schneider and Jack Ferry with production support by Taylor Hines and our production coordinator is Sonny Chen. Thank you again for listening.